Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much uh, to Jennifer and Frank for putting this uh, together. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with everybody today. Um, what I'd like to do is start off by uh, talking a little bit about this man right here. How many of you guys recognize this guy? Okay. This is Tony Little, fitness guru. So Tony Little has been incredibly successful over the years selling exercise uh, equipment, if you want to call it that, exercise contraptions, um, uh, exercise dust collectors, right? But he's been extremely successful selling these products uh, over uh, many, many years through infomercials using pretty standard infomercial tactics and lines and slogans. But after hiring this woman, Colleen Zott, and I bet you none of you recognize her, uh, she's, she's called the, the queen of the infomercial. She's a very uh, well-regarded infomercial consultant. Well, after hiring Colleen Zott, uh, sales of his latest contraption, the Gazelle, skyrocketed. So what's particularly remarkable about this uh, huge increase in sales is that uh, it's been attributed to a seemingly small change in an infomercial line that we all know very, very well. Right? And that line is, operators are standing by, please call now. Right? We've all heard this line a million times, sometimes a million times within a given infomercial. Right? Right? And uh, people just take it for granted. This is part of the standard uh, practice. Well, Colleen Zott took a look at that line and realized that there was uh, an opportunity uh, that was being missed. And she changed the line from, operators are standing by, please call now, to, if operators are busy, please call again. Right? Now, on the face of it, right, from a business perspective, this seems suicidal. Right? It's hard enough getting a guy like this to be interested in exercising in the first place. <laughs> Right? But now, you're conveying this information that if this guy bothers to take his finger out of his mouth and uses it to dial the numbers on the screen, right, he might encounter a busy signal and have to keep trying. Right? So from, uh, just from a, a surface standpoint, it doesn't seem like a very uh, wise move. But if you think a little harder about it, think about the type of mental imagery that comes to mind when you consider these two lines. Right? On the one hand, right, you have operators are standing by. Right, so you imagine scores of bored-looking representatives twiddling their thumbs or you know, dozing off or practicing long division or doing something to entertain themselves. Uh, okay, that's clearly indicative of, of low sales and poor demand, right? On the other hand, operators are busy. Uh, if operators are busy, please call again. You have the idea, the mental imagery, that the phones are, are uh, ringing off the hook, uh, which clearly is indicative of uh, uh, a lot of popularity of the, uh, of the product. Okay, so in essence, what Colleen Zott was doing was she was changing the perceptions of the social norms regarding the popularity of the gazelle. And now we can argue over the, the ethics of what she was doing, but I think there's an important uh, uh, point there to, uh, to take in. Now, Colleen Zott was using uh, social norms to uh, try to hawk merchandise. Uh, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about something I, I would consider a, a little more noble. Uh, which is trying to promote uh, energy conservation, uh, 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 other types of resource conservation, water conservation, and environmental conservation uh, in general. So that's what I uh, will talk about today. Uh, although I'm going to focus on environmental conservation, uh, the principles that I'm, I'm, I'll be talking about today uh, can easily be transferred to uh, any other uh, pro-social domain or nearly any other pro-social domain. So here's the, here's the thing. When people are tasked with the challenge of trying to get people to promote or trying to get people to uh, engage in uh, conservation behaviors, I think policymakers and communicators make a, a common mistake. Right? They often make the faulty assumption that the best, or in some cases even the only way to uh, spur conservation behavior is to focus on the merits of the argument. Right? And this is what a lot of us do when we think about how to persuade others. We think, well, what are the merits of our case? So if you think about conservation, there are a lot of merits, right? Conserving resources will help save the environment. Uh, it'll help uh, benefit society and future generations. And of course, conserving resources will help you save money. Right? But the argument is that one alternative, and it's really not an alternative, but more of a supplement right, to this approach, is thinking about the power of social norms. Uh, right? Tell consumers how their peers are behaving. And the idea is that uh, people will conform to the behaviors of their peers. But what I think is interesting is that uh, people, although they'll conform, they uh, won't understand the power of social norms on their own behavior. Right? So even though people are doing it, there's sort of a mismatch right, between 
uh, the actual influence of social norms and the perceived influence of social norms. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So the first two studies I'm going to talk uh, with you about today are, are designed to sort of get at this mismatch between the uh, perception of the power of norms and the actual uh, influence of those norms. So in this first study, we surveyed about 800 California residents and we asked them to rate the strength of a, a number of factors in influencing their decision to conserve energy at home. Right, so uh, we asked them, for example, you know, when you conserve energy at home, to what extent are you doing it? Because conserving energy uh, helps uh, save the environment, right? So we have environmental protection. To what extent are you doing it because it benefits society, uh, because it saves you money, or because other people are doing it? We take a look at the data here and we find that people think that they're quite uh, uh, altruistic and right, they say, well, I'm doing it to help save the environment. And to a, a little bit of a lesser extent, to, because it benefits society in general, right, people are willing to say, yeah, okay, uh, you know, I do it to save money as well. And finally, dead last in this group is because other people are doing it. So we wanted to see if this uh, perception actually uh, matched reality. So in a follow-up study, uh, we conducted an experiment with about uh, 300 homes in a California neighborhood. Uh, we placed signs on the residents' doors encouraging them to conserve energy. So uh, we also gave them some ideas of how to do it. We said, uh, you know, during the summer months, using fans instead of air conditioning will help, uh, save, uh, uh, will, uh, help uh, save the environment, for example. Um, and we also varied the reasons for conserving uh, on the signs to be in accordance with these different uh, motivating factors that I just mentioned uh, a minute ago. So we have a no sign control here. I don't know where the, oh, that didn't work. But anyway, here's the punchline. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have uh, here the no sign control, right? uh, the environmental protection, benefit to society, saving money. And we had another condition in which we uh, told them true information, which is that a prior survey indicated that 77% of people in that neighborhood uh, had indicated that they try to use fans instead of air conditioning. Right? And so we had sort of equivalent information. Uh, for example, we said, uh, you know, our findings are that you can save $54 a month by using fans instead of air conditioning. Right? And what you find here is that perception uh, doesn't really meet reality. Right? Uh, it, I don't know where the pointer is on this thing, but I'll, I guess I can use my finger like in the <laughs> olden days. Um, but uh, so what you find here is if you, uh, you look at the uh, y-axis is energy consumption, right? And these are not statistically significantly different from no sign control, right? However, the only one where you find a benefit, where you find an increase in conservation is when people are told that everybody else is doing it, right? Even though that's the one that people uh, say doesn't influence them at all. So a couple conclusions from these studies. Uh, you know, despite the fact that people estimate social norms to be the least powerful, uh, we found that, in fact, they were the most powerful. Now, I think that this is interesting because uh, now marketers right, take pride in knowing all the tricks in the book. Right? People who are, again, hawking products like Tony Little. But oftentimes, the people who are challenged with the task of trying to promote conservation they are, don't necessarily know every trick in the book, and they don't necessarily go through every trick in the book. What they often do is they say to themselves, well, what would influence me? Right? Just what I was saying before. And they say to themselves, well, I think that I can serve because uh, it helps save the environment, or it saves money, or these other uh, reasons. So what this means is that it's a missed opportunity. Right? When people actually design these campaigns themselves, they say to themselves, you know, well, what will influence me? And then they use those exact rationales. If they don't think that they can be influenced by social norms, they often sort of forget about the possibility of using them on others. So uh, my colleagues and I have actually conducted a number of studies uh, where we uh, investigate uh, whether or not we can uh, produce this type of effect in other domains. Before I really introduce the uh, general ideas that we tested, let me just briefly introduce the domain uh, in which we tested uh, one of our ideas, uh, hotel towels. So until recently, the, the greatest towel-related dilemma that uh, guests faced is reflected in an old joke told by the nightclub comic Henny Youngman. So speaking about his accommodations from the night before, Henny said, you know, what a hotel. The towels were so big and so fluffy, I could hardly close my suitcase. <laughs> right. But it, 
the, the moral dilemma facing travelers has changed, right? It's no longer a question of whether or not to remove the towels uh, from one's hotel room, but rather whether or not to reuse the towels from one's hotel. And so we've all encountered these signs, right, in hotels with uh, increasing frequency. We see these signs urging us to uh, reuse our towels in order to help save the environment. Now, my colleagues and I have, have, have done a sort of informal survey, a.k.a. we steal the signs wherever we go. Uh, <laughs> that didn't appear in the paper, though. Uh, we've done an informal survey. Uh, every uh, hotel that we've ever been to, right, to take a look, what's the content, right? Somebody has to write that content to promote uh, the resource conservation. Right? And of course, the hotels get a lot out of this. Not only do they genuinely uh, help reduce water consumption and energy consumption, right, and the amount of uh, pollutants in terms of detergents that are released into the environment, but it also boosts their bottom line, right? If they don't have to wash the towels, then uh, they can save money in, in a number of different respects. Uh, but what we found is that almost, uh, with no ex uh, almost with no exception, every single sign focuses on the benefits to the environment. And that makes total sense, right? Well, here's a question that is important to, to look at. Right? Do these signs actually work? Well, we were surprised by what we found. Uh, we had actually looked into it and seen that there were some studies showing that up to three out of four individuals who are asked to reuse their towels do so at least sometime during their stay. It right? doesn't mean that they're doing it with every towel every day, but at least once during their stay. So 75%, that's, that's a pretty amazing social norm. And yet, of all the hotels that we had surveyed, we had never seen anyone actually communicating this social norm uh, to the guests. So we decided to see uh, whether we could, uh, in fact, do that. And, uh, and we'll take a look at the uh, results in a second. So we uh, were fortunate enough to solicit the cooperation of a manager of a local Holiday Inn who allowed us to create our own signs and alter what the wording on those signs uh, would be. Uh, so this gives you an idea of what some of the signs look like. Uh, it says, please reuse the towels on the top. We, we based it off of a lot of signs that we had seen. Uh, we had a uh, room attendant a supervisor place the signs in the room, and we're very, very careful. Uh, normally, you have seasoned research assistants collect our data. In this case, it was the room attendant. So we were very careful to make sure uh, that they were trained and uh, understood what counted as uh, towel reuse or not. So this gives you an idea of what the sort of standard environmental message is. Uh, help save the environment. The environment deserves our respect. You can show your respect for nature and help save the environment by reusing your towels during your stay. I should also note that the back of all of these signs had specific information on how the environment would be uh, uh, saved and, and helped by uh, towel reuse. So I mentioned a minute ago that there's this social norm that uh, none of the hotels has been com uh, have been communicating. So we have one uh, that tries to get at that. This one says, join your fellow guests in helping to save the environment. 75% uh, of guests participated in a new resource savings program by using their towels more than once. Uh, you can join them uh, by reusing your towels during your stay. Now there's a third condition, there's a third message that I'm going to tell you about in just a minute. But before I get to that uh, message, let's just take a quick look at the data. Right? This is the change in towel reuse rate compared to the sort of standard environmental uh, appeal. Hey, and what we find is a 20% increase compared to the standard uh, sign that uh, we see in just about every hotel. And again, think about how cheap these signs are to produce. Right? And hotels are missing out on an opportunity, presumably because they don't think that people will be influenced uh, by this information. So OK, that's great. We know people you know, follow the herd, right? but there's a lot of herds out there. Right, so one question that uh, a lot of researchers have tackled, uh, certainly we're, we're uh, not the only ones, uh, is there's a lot of herds out there, so which herds are going to be most influential? Uh, and again, there's quite a bit of research, and I'll just talk about uh, this one point. Um, so similarity right, is, a, is a key a trigger that makes people feel especially likely to conform to the, uh, their peers' behaviors. Right, so we decided to go for uh, a sort of greater similarity. If you remember the, uh, the social norm uh, sign that I told you about a minute ago, that sign indicated that 75% of guests at the hotel had reused their towels. So how can you, get, you, know, how can you actually alter the perception of similarity? Well, here's what we did. In this case, all the information was exactly the same, except we said 75% of the guests who stayed in your room, number 321 or whatever number 
uh, whatever room you were staying in. Is, is that really sort of logical similarity? Is that a similarity that, that really is meaningful in any way? Doesn't seem like it, right? Well, let's take a look at the results. Uh, there we find a 33% increase. Now think about that. I mean, is that really rational? Right? If you think about it, there's actually no group of people that's done more to reduce the quality of your room and everything inside it than the very people who have stayed there previously, right? We often don't even want to think about what these people are doing in our room. <laughs> Uh, and for those of you staying in a hotel uh, while you're uh, here for the conference, have fun getting to sleep tonight. Right? We don't normally think of these people, right? if we're being really thoughtful, we don't think of uh, these people as uh, particularly likable or any more similar to us. Right? But, it, but often when we're in thinking, this little trigger, this little cue that we're using that says, hey, these people were in my environment. Right? We shared an environment. We shared circumstances. We shared a situation. Right? And uh, therefore, we found uh, people were more likely to uh, conform to those behaviors. All right, so a couple uh, quick conclusions before uh, moving on to another uh, study. So only focusing on the merits of the case right, didn't produce optimal influence, right? So not only hotel chains, but lots of businesses are missing out on opportunities to promote conservation by ignoring the power of social norms. And when I present this material, a lot of people say, oh, but social, it's so obvious, right? Well, we already know people follow the herd. But if it's so obvious, then why aren't the hotels doing it when they can actually benefit quite a bit uh, from changing these uh, signs in just a very, very small way? Right? And finally, when conveying social norms, it's really important to convey the norms that most closely match the environment and circumstances of one's audience, right? no matter how sort of silly or, meaning or meaningless the connection. But in many cases, re remember, the connection is meaningful. So for example, if you were trying to get people to uh, recycle in uh, Palo Alto, and you had uh, some uh, survey data that showed that 85% of people in Palo Alto recycle and 87% of people in California recycle, then uh, the argument is you should, you should make sure you hone your norm to the audience's, uh, uh, to the audience's environment. Right? It would be better to tell people the norms of Palo, fellow Palo Alto uh, residents than California at large. So, the hotel study and the study that, that uh, preceded it showed that it's often a mistake to not communicate social norms. But there are also circumstances in which it may in fact be a mistake to communicate social norms. So has anybody ever been to the Petrified Forest National Park in Arizona? Okay, so you know, right, it contains a lot of these uh, little pieces of petrified wood which are very pretty. Lots of people like to grab them as souvi you know, souvenirs for grandma. Uh, but that threatens the, the existence of the park. But what's interesting is that a, a graduate student colleague of mine, upon entering the park, saw this sign. And this sign is at the entrance, or at least was at the entrance, and uh, is in fact throughout the entire park. And here's what the sign says. It says, your heritage is being vandalized every day by theft losses of petrified wood of 14 tons a year, mostly a small piece at a time. Right? Now, uh, this graduate student colleague had said that when he visited the park, he was with his fiance, who he describes as the single most honest person he's ever met. Right? This person would not take a paper clip without returning it. And he claims that before he could even finish reading the sign, he felt a, a nudge into his ribs. Right? And she said, well, we better get ours now. <laughs> right? There's a couple things operating there. There are a couple reasons why this sign is bad. Scarcity is one of them as well. Right? But the point here is that it's a big, the big mistake is to a lot of uh, people in nonprofits, a lot of people who are looking to uh, promote energy conservation or other types of conservation, to mobilize the action, to get people excited and interested and worried about the problem, they often sort of decry it as, uh, you know, a, a, as a huge problem, as regrettably frequent. And this might in fact be a huge mistake. And the idea is that within this statement, look at all the people who are doing this undesirable thing, Right, with the emphasis on undesirable, right, lurks the powerful and undercutting message, look at all the people who are doing this. Right? So the message that's being communicated is not necessarily the message that uh, is being taken in. Uh, now, I can't claim credit for uh, the study I'm going to uh, talk to you about. My colleague Robert Cialdini and a number of his colleagues conducted this study, but I thought it was important enough uh, to uh, bring up uh, in this talk. So they noticed this sign and uh, found it to be very worrisome and asked the park, hey, can we come in, <clears throat> can we come in and create our own signs 
and salt various paths with little pieces of petrified wood and see whether or not this, uh, the wording of the sign makes a difference. So the park said, sure. And there's three uh, conditions I'll tell you about. Um, the first one is uh, a reflection of the signs that we see throughout the park. Many past visitors have removed petri uh, petrified wood from the park, changing the natural state of the petrified forest. Right? And there's, if you notice, there are a number of people up here who are stealing the wood. A different one just simply says, just don't do it. Okay? And it pictures a lone thief. Right? So please don't remove the petrified wood from the park in order to preserve the natural state of the petrified forest. And then there was a third condition that was a, a no sign control. So there was no sign in front of uh, these various paths. Right? And uh, there was uh, a lot of methodological rigor. So uh, this happened over a number of weeks. And uh, they changed the uh, signs in front of the different paths uh, in a very organized manner. Right? So we can feel confident about sort of random assignment. And here's what they find. So in the no sign control, right, they get a theft rate of about 3%. Okay, well, I mean, you know, that's actually not that much, seemingly. Uh, what about when you just say, don't do it, and you depict a lone thief? Well, good, at least we know the signs, right? Some signs seem to be doing something, so this cuts theft in, uh, in half. But what about when you have this negative social norm, when you're communicating that everybody else is doing it? Right? <laughs> you triple wood theft. Right? So this is not a crime prevention strategy, it's a crime promotion strategy. Right? This is obviously very worrisome. So there are a lot of examples of this. I mean, I think that this is one of the, uh, the most common. In fact, uh, once you see this, I'm guaranteeing you that within the next week, you will see an example of this. I guarantee it, right? Because I've been seeing it ever since. And there are a lot of examples of this, right? Here's another one that's in very environment oriented. Uh, here's uh, Woodsy Owl, who says, this year Americans will produce more litter and pollution than ever before, right? And you might say, well, you know, okay, if you don't do something about it, who will? And that might strike a chord with some people. But again, it's communicating that uh, lots of other people are doing it. And there's another case uh, where the, the, government, the government decided that because so many people were cheating on their taxes, that they would have to increase the penalties. And what they did was they increased the penalties everywhere, but they ran an ad campaign in Minnesota. And that ad campaign said, because so many people are cheating on their taxes, we've decided to increase the fines. And guess what happened in Minnesota? <laughs> Tax cheating went up. Right? There, uh, in fact, here's another one that I saw just recently. Uh, this uh, is a very clever, uh, very, very, very clever ad uh, in a, uh, a bus stop. Uh, in fact, it, it has won awards uh, from Ad Week. So it says, this is the rubbish dropped around the bus stop since Monday. So I don't know if you can tell, um, the picture is a little bit bigger than it was on my uh, computer. So here's a bus stop. Uh, there's basically plexiglass that allows uh, workers to put in all the garbage that's surrounding this. Right? Very clever, right? Except here's what happened within just a week's period of time. All right? So, so well, this is evident. I mean, this is evident. It seems to be getting worse and worse and worse, right, in a very short period of time. Because you're essentially communicating to everybody, hey, look at all the trash that's surrounding. So why should you have to do anything different? Uh, in fact, I, so this was uh, an ad campaign that uh, was in, I think, Auckland, New Zealand. Let me show you one that I thought was, this is not an ad campaign. It's just a, a way to think about uh, how you set up your uh, waste disposal bins. This is from Sweden. I thought this was very clever. Right in the middle of a, of a very uh, frequented square, they have a see-through garbage can. So what that means, right, is that, OK, there might be some litter here or there, right? That's going to happen. But what is the social norm indicating to people? All, almost all of the garbage is in the, the garbage bin, right? There might be a few uh, on the periphery. But it's a very clever way of indicating most people are, in fact, putting their garbage uh, where it belongs. I thought that was very clever. So uh, describing a problem as widespread might be the right strategy when seeking funding or resources or staffing from purse holders, right? If you're trying to get a grant from somebody, if you're trying to get Congress to enact a law, if you're trying to do these things, it does make sense to indicate how prevalent the problem is, right? But it's important not to generalize this approach to the general public, right? Who may be in, uh, they may interpret these descriptions as popularizing and also legitimizing uh, the undesirable activity. So 
Uh, we talked about some situations in which the social norm uh, can lead people to engage in uh, good behaviors, uh, cases in which different social norms can lead people to engage in bad behaviors, but there's a certain type of social norm that could lead people to do both depending on who the audience member is. And that's what this uh, next study is about. So uh, let me actually uh, try to make it, uh, the, the, the design clear uh, by using some of my favorite Simpsons characters. How many people here are familiar with The Simpsons? Okay, that's good. It actually, and the reason I'm using this, by the way, is it gets, the terminology gets very weird when you say a lower than average energy consumer, uh, but that's a above average person, right, if you're moralizing. So that's why I'm using these pictures here. Well, the notion is that if you could go into a town and get the average amount of energy usage, right, for every individual or every resident, right, well, what would happen if you publicize that information? Well, here on the one hand, we have the lower than average energy consumer, right? We have the tree huggers, the people who care about the environment. And on the other hand, we have people who, uh, for both profession and hobby, would like to destroy the environment as best they can, right? So people who are very high energy uh, consumers. Well, the notion is that when you tell them the average of their town, then that average is going to act as somewhat of a magnet Right, drawing people in, right? So the higher than average energy consumers are in fact going to reduce their energy consumption, and that's a good thing, right? I mean, that's a great thing. But what's going to happen to those goody two shoes, those people who actually see that they're in fact under consuming compared to the average? Well, we'd like to believe that those people will see that feedback and say, oh, wow, I'm a good person, I'm doing the right thing, or even competitively, right? I'm winning, good for me. But in fact, uh, that's not what we predict. Right? Because the, the norm is typically something that pe people, I mean, there are cases in which people want to deviate from the norm, right? but that norm validates right, that they can use a little bit more energy and, and who cares. So what we did was we uh, ran a study again in California, about three or 400 homes, and we had a baseline period where we were able to, me uh, to measure the average amount of energy consumption in the neighborhood as well as get individual uh, residents energy consumption. After the baseline period, uh, we, we were able to divide people up as sort of above average and below average, right? And we basically gave everybody their real feedback. This is not making anything up. Here's the norm uh, for the community. Here's where you are and here's where you are. And let's see what we find. This is the change in energy consumption. Okay, consistent with our predictions, those uh, higher than average individuals um, actually reduce their energy consumption uh, significantly. Right? Well, that's a really good thing. Again, right? I mean, that's a great thing in terms of uh, reducing consumption. But what about those goody two-shoes, those Lisa Simpsons, those tree huggers? We actually find that they actually increase their uh, energy consumption. Right? Well, this is, a, this is not a good thing, right? Uh, you can say, well, maybe you just don't give them any feedback, right? But, but it's sort of an interesting question. Is there any way where you can potentially reduce this backfire effect? And again, implicitly, it doesn't seem to, to, to really make sense, right? If I find out that I'm doing better than the rest, shouldn't I feel like society approves of me? I'm a good person, right? And that might, that might spur me to conserve energy even more. But I think the problem as communicators, we think, yeah, sure, I mean, that person will feel good about themselves, right? We don't need to tell them that, that they're good people. They'll know it when they see the feedback. But we decided to actually run another set of conditions in this experiment in which we gave them exactly the same kind of information, except we gave them a form of explicit approval or disapproval depending on whether or not they were above or below. So it's exactly the same feedback, except if you are a uh, lower than average energy consumer, we give you the smiley face. If you're above average, we give you the frowny face. Right? That's a, a very specific symbol of society's approval or disapproval uh, of you. So here's what we find. Turns out, we were a little bit surprised. We thought, well, maybe if we give these people the, the frowny face, then they're going to reduce their consumption even more. It turns out not to be the case. They reduce their consumption just about the same level. Right? However, and this is not statistically significant. It's just a small little bump. There might be a little bit of regression to the mean here. But uh, simply adding a lone smiley face reduces the backfire effect. All right. Oh, and before I get to the conclusions, I'll tell you that since we've uh, run this research, 
uh, there have actually been uh, a number of utilities that have adopted this method and have uh, uh, generated some additionally uh, creative things. So, uh, right, they have all neighbors, right, this is a number of kilowatts used or whatever. You, right, so you're much worse than that. And one thing that they've adopted is, is pretty clever. Right? You think about those people, the Lisa Simpsons, the good energy consumers, well, how can you make them feel even more motivated, right? Even if it's in a sort of competitive sense. What they do is they take the top 10 or 20% of efficient neighbors, right? And that way you're always compare. almost everybody is seeing that they can do better. Right? And in fact, according to a, a recent article we saw in the New York Times, uh, utilities that have used this method have reduced uh, energy consumption. You know, it's not a huge amount. Uh, per household, but overall it's a, it's a pretty big difference by about 6% right, using this method and, and it's really not very expensive uh, to run this type of campaign. So just a couple of general conclusions here. Uh, social norms can be very uh, helpful to sort of supplement the merits of the argument, right? We always think, well, how can we convince somebody to conserve? Let's think about what, what matters, right? But it's not just those arguments. We have to also use uh, peer influence. Uh, it's important to match the social norms to the audience, right? But if communicators and policymakers are not careful in how they use, uh, how and when they use those social norms, right, they can make a bad problem worse. Uh, and implicit approval is often not enough, right? We may think, well, you know, we don't have to go and tell those people who are good energy uh, users that they're good. They'll know they're good. Well, the research suggests that no, we need to be very explicit in approving their behavior. Anyway, that's uh, it. I just wanted to thank you very much. I also want to thank my collaborators, Bob Cialdini, Vladis uh Jessica Nolan, Wes Schultz. Uh, also thanks to Paul Brest, uh, who is here, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation for their generous support, uh, which made much of this research possible. So thank you very much for that. Uh, one last thing, if anybody here is, what did you say? <laughs> Smiley face, exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, uh, also, if anybody here is, uh, is interested in collaborating on any uh, field research, uh, you can you know, always call me. Um, uh, but if the phone line is busy, just please call back. Thank you very much. Oh, go ahead, Paul. person believes they are. And so in the hotel case, uh, my guess is it wasn't the case, or if it was, it was purely accidental that 75% of the people who occupied room 321 recycled their towels. That, that creates sort of both a um, empirical question, you know, kind of how, how you tell people that the social norms are where you hope they will be, but also a, a normative moral question about how especially public policy makers, you know, the limits of their uh, describing social norms that, that are actually not the case. And could you talk about that? Yeah, I think you're, I think you're right. I mean, it, it is an important uh, moral question, right? To the extent that you are uh, fudging the numbers, you're right. There was no way of knowing that people in that particular room uh, for sure were, you know, or 75% of those individuals. Um, and, and normally we wouldn't, if I had to counsel, uh, ho you know, the hotel industry, I would not, I would not necessarily feel comfortable saying this is what uh, you need to do unless you actually collect those data. Um, but as we all know, statistics can be uh, massaged, right, to, to change people's perceptions. So one thing that I note is that uh, if you think back to that, uh, uh, the Petrified Forest study, baseline there was about 3% or 3% uh, theft rate. Well, there are a lot of ways, right? So the, the uh, petrified forest is saying, look at all the zillions of people who are stealing wood. Well, 3% is actually a pretty low number, right? So I think a, a lot of this is, is searching out, seeking out what those right numbers are. And I would say it's, it's uh, totally moral and ethical to find those numbers and say, hey, look, we actually have a very small theft rate. Or another way of doing it would be to say, millions of people come to the park every year and don't steal wood. Right, which is in fact true. But I, I, I agree with you that there are sort of ethical gray, uh, you know, gray areas where you have to uh, you know, be very uh, considerate of whether or not you are uh, giving people, first of all, factually incorrect information, which is obviously uh, immoral, uh, or you're massaging the statistics too much. But that's, that's a very good point. Right, go ahead. You spoke a little bit about similarity. Um, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on kind of two points. First, 
when you think about similarity, what is the right level? As in, you know, is it like we're people or we're Americans or we're Californians or something of that sort and how, how broad can it be? And also, if there's something beyond similarity that can help make people conform to social norms as well in your research. Sure. So, so this is a very uh, interesting question you're asking. I mean, in fact, I, I like the example because it's, on, it, it's a bit counter to what I was saying earlier, right? If uh, the argument is, okay, if you're talking about uh, trying to convince people in Santa Monica to recycle, you should use the Santa Monica uh, norm. But that's assuming that there isn't a really strong uh, identification with you know, California, let's say, right? If someone really identified themselves as a Californian, then maybe that, uh, maybe that norm would be more effective. I would guess not. But I, I, I like your example that you gave, which is to say American, right? Because there are some people who really strongly identify as, a, right, as that's part of their identity. And so that actually is a case where you might see an exception to that, where the sort of the broader level uh, you know, norm is, in fact, more influential. So that's, that's a very interesting question. Uh, and what was your second question? It was. Yeah, so uh, there are a lot of factors that are, are, are relevant. Um, first of all, the numbers matter, right? The higher the norm, the more likely people are going to do it. There are always exceptions. Uh, a, a factor that's, that's relevant less to the norm itself and more to the, the person in the situation having to make the decisions would be uncertainty. So th to the uh, extent that people are sort of uncertain or they're in novel situations, right, or they don't feel uh, necessarily strongly one way or the other, they're going to be more likely to, uh, to follow norms. And there's a, a whole host of other, uh, of, of other factors I'm happy to chat with you about. There was a hand over. I don't know. How much time do we have? We're good? Go ahead. So over the past couple of decades, the big excitement in social psychology has been about implicit attitudes governing behavior. Um, so I'm just hoping you can comment um, about the relationship between implicit attitudes and social norms, and specifically when the two diverge, what governs behavior? So, so th that, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure that I, have, uh, that I have an answer. I don't know that there's been, in fact, there are people here who do some implicit stuff I'm looking over in this side of the room. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure that there has been a study of, of sort of the, where, those, where they diverge. Um, <laughs> the answer, short answer is no. Uh, I, I'm not a, it's, it's funny, I'm actually, I'm not a big implicit guy. I mean, it's not that I don't believe in it, but, but uh, it, it's, it's not my area of expertise. So, but let me think about it, and I'll, I'll riff a little later. It'll be a little less riff and more planned. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you had your hand up? Yeah, I was thinking, um, related to similarity, could there be also then um, kind of like role of where the individual wants to a aspire to whoever, like celebrities play a huge influence because of, it's not so much similarity, but an aspiration. I'm glad you brought that up. So I forgot to, to, to mention that as part of my answer to the, uh, the earlier question. Ab absolutely, right? So I was sort of taking status as, as, as uh, equivalent, right, across conditions. Certainly, there are aspirational groups, and I think one example of that would be those, like, you know, efficient neighbors, right? Now, you're, you're right about celebrities as, as, as one form of aspirational group, but I thought it was a very clever use of an aspirational group to say, hey, look, these are the really efficient people. Look how little they're using. Right? And certainly, if you think of yourself as inefficient, it doesn't mean that you're only going to follow the norms of the un other inefficient people. To the extent that you have other reasons to be motivated to do, right, to achieve what that uh, aspirational group has achieved, then you're going to be more likely to, uh, to you know, follow those norms. But good question. Time? We're good? Okay, I'm happy to answer your question at the end if we're, yeah. okay, we'll talk.